So it is live on YouTube. Uh, it's recorded on YouTube. Actually, all of the lectures will be posted on the YouTube channel. There's a link to it in the syllabus. So um, I guess I'll wait the two minutes. To give her a there should not be more students than there are chairs. But no, I guess we're good. We're still empty chairs. People come in. Somebody, what did you do for summer vacation? We thought we were just right. You come home, you come back to school, and everybody does a little book report what I did for summer vacation. Maybe we turn the fun for summer vacation. I'll turn the volume back. Maybe I'll turn the volume down. Didn't seem to have any effect. I know how to do it. Somebody did something fun for summer vacation? Tell me. What'd you do? A train trip to Montana. Uh, Amtrak? Uh, they, they have the, like, the Western Flyer, what is it called? The Empire Building. Yeah, I, I actually wanted to do that trip once. I was going to fly to California and then do the Amtrak all the way back. Um, until I found out how expensive it was. You, you fly to California, buy a new car, and drive back would be cheaper. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I had, a, I had an interesting experience on Amtrak a couple years ago trying to go to a conference, and I thought, oh, this will be fun. I can take the train right there. I could, but it was hard to get home. Uh, anybody else? What, oh, what's your name? Maddie. All right, so Maddie went to Montana on a train. You saw the Grand Canyon. I've seen the Grand Canyon, but only on TV. That's cool. What did you do? I worked for the National Security Technology Fire. See, that's the kind of cool thing that I would have been about. Had a cool job at NIST. Where, where was it? Out in Gainesburg? Cool. Outstanding. Um, did you meet Lydia? Oh, what the hell is Lydia's last name? Chinese woman with a PhD from WPI that works at NIST in Gaithersburg. She did some fire research when she was here, so I didn't know if she was working on that. It was, it was all digital, and she wasn't on the team. Yeah, I, um, oh, because it was all Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. Did anybody have a Zoom free summer? You did! You're my heroes. I did not have a Zoom free summer. Um, all right, this seems like, all right, it seems like we're live on YouTube. This mic should be picking up the stuff that's going to YouTube, and I turned the gain way up. So it should still work if I stand over here as long as I enunciate. You guys are here for ME1800? Sweet, that means I came to the right classroom. <laughs> yeah, um, there should be, enough, should be enough seats. There's one over here. One on the end there. One in the middle over there. One time, C term, I think it was a C term. I was mistaken about which classroom this class was going to be in. And it was scheduled for 11 o'clock. And I got there a few minutes early because I like to bring stuff and set up before I get there. And so I went into Washburn 229. Who, who's a freshman? Wait. Who is a freshman for the sake of going to classes on campus? So it's probably most of the sophomores also. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so Washburn 229, second floor building across from us. It's right upstairs from where we do the labs. And right upstairs from where my office is. It's a very convenient classroom for me to teach in. And I, um, I got there. And the jerk, idiot, other professor that had the class before mine was still talking to the kids. But I was a little bit early. So I, I, I looked in and I, I kind of went out. I went, got myself a glass of water. I came back and now it was well within the, we're supposed to have that 10 minute window to change classes. We end at 1150 and the next one starts at 12. That was well into that 10 minute window. And he was still talking to the kids. And I thought for a second. I said, I wonder if this is my classroom. 
So I asked him, and he says, no, we have another hour in here. And so then I went and looked at the schedule and realized I was teaching on the second floor of Atwater Kent, not the second floor of Washburn that term. I was a little bit late for that lecture. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm super excited to be standing in front of a room with people in it. So if I get carried away, that's me. I, um, <laughs> there's a slight echo here on the phone. You guys can hear it. Let's see if I turn the volume down a little bit. Maybe it'll go away. Oh, it got less. Um, what is, it's going to be really annoying. Can I mute it? All right, you know, it's not annoying for me if I stand over here. So I'm going to stand over here so I can't, you go ahead and find a seat. There's got to be a seat. If not, you could sit on the floor. No, I'm just kidding. There's, there's got to be a chair. Somebody raise your hand if there's a chair next to you. All right, who's here because they have an ad drop slip and they want me to sign them into the class? I cannot sign any ad drop slips. Uh, it's a safety thing. If we over enroll the labs, they won't be safe. However, for the first time in the 30 years that I've been at WPI, the wait list appears to be operating as it seems like it should be intended. And I have observed the class to lose someone because they switched to another class is the next person on the wait list to come into the class. I have observed that this term is the first time in 30 years I've ever seen it happen. Um, so all these people that complain about Workday, and I'm one of them, that feature seems to work. Although just as the term was starting and I asked the registrar how that was going to happen, they told me absolutely no way would that ever work. So at least the wait list feature in Workday seemed I haven't really been paying attention if it was the person at the top of the wait list they got in. What I know is that the numbers keep changing and they seem to change the way they should change. So if you if you have a problem getting in the class that way, um, all I can say is complain to the red truck. Uh, I would love to sign more people into the class. And you, you don't have to leave. Stick around for today because you might learn something useful and you might get in the class because half of these people might decide they don't want to be in the class after today. You'll never, you'll never know. Um, and there was somebody that emailed me. She's in section something and wants to change to section something else. Not a detailed person in that way. Um, if two people want to switch which section they're in, we can do that. We don't even need to go through the registrar. It can be very informal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a discussion forum thread for anybody that wants to switch sections with somebody. It's just a matter of, of the number of time slots we have available to be in the lab for that. Um, all right. You guys know that this class is about manufacturing? Perfect. Anybody surprised? Great. Okay. What is manufacturing? Because we don't define that at the beginning, the class is going to be kind of lame. something. Uh, what's your name? How Hajin. Hajin. Hajin says that it's to create something. Raise your hand if you think manufacturing is to create something. Or the definition of manufacturing includes to create something. Uh, raise your hand if you don't think so. All right, so we're all agreed. Hajin? Yeah. Hajin. We're all agreed that Hajin has a start on the definition. Raise your hand if you think that's the whole definition of manufacturing. All right, maybe. What's your name? Alex. Alex. Okay, so Alex thinks maybe it could be the whole definition. Yeah. I think I can define manufacturing in... I think I can define manufacturing in four words. None of those words are create. But 
there's enough, um, what's the word, synonym? Create maybe a synonym for the word I would use. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to be against that. If it's not just to create something, what, what are some synonyms for create? Yeah. Produce. Fabricate. Fabricate. Alter. Anybody else? Somebody in the back row. One, two, third from the back, back, third from the this side, black mask. A synonym for create. Anybody else? Black. Oh, Jesus, there's like a whole row of black masks over there. It's gonna say black mask second from the back. Not black mask. Second row from the back over here. WBI shirt or something. <laughs> <laughs> I used to uh, I used to start this lecture with a slide, and uh, and I had sharpies and pieces of paper. I also had TAs at the time that would bring those things. Um, but it said make a tent card with your name. And then I would make you all bring your tent card with your name to every class so that I could call on you by name. Uh, but now I'm going to call on you by mask. <laughs> what is, oh, that was WPI mask. Synonym for make. Or shit, make. How about make? We can say make. <laughs> Synonym for create. Anything else that comes to mind, though? Produce, make, create. Design. Design. Is design on the list? So create, produce, make. You could create, produce, or make a design. Is designing mean? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no on design. What did I miss? Any? Somebody said. Nothing important. Okay. So, oh, fabricate, somebody said. I'm not a good speller, so I will just write part of the word. I think I spelled the first three letters correctly. Create, produce, make, fabricate. But I said that's not the whole definition. It is the first word of my definition, though. Pick one of those. It doesn't matter which one. I use make. What should we make? Something. Stuff. Things. Products. Make stuff. We could make, we could create, we could manufacture designs. So I was an undergraduate student here and a graduate student here, and now I teach here. I basically was way too lazy to find a real job, and I liked WPI, so I stayed here. And um, when I was an undergraduate student, I was on the ski team. One of my good friends on the ski team was a graduate student. He may have been coaching by then, but uh, he was a manufacturing engineering graduate student. And there was an office in Washburn on the third floor that was all of the manufacturing engineering graduate students. And on the door to the office, they had this cute little sign. It said thesis fabrication area. So fabricate has more than one meaning, right? I always thought that was fine. Um, so they were fabricating their theses. Create, make, fabricate, stuff things, products, designs, we need two more words, right? I'll, I'll give you the third word. It could be two. It could be with the intent to. It could be meaning to. Yeah. Distribute. Say again. Distribute. All right. He says distribute. That is not the word I would use, and it is not a... Synonym of the word I would use. Go ahead, the back. Um, 
Make specifications goes in this column. It's really part of a design. So, cell. So distribution is part of the process of selling. But manufacturing is only make things to sell. And that's what makes it different from making. Because right? we can make stuff, right? And I mean, who's, who's been to a makerspace before, right? What kind of equipment do they have in makerspaces? They have manufacturing equipment in makerspaces usually. The cool ones all claim to have manufacturing equipment anyway, right? But the making part of making is just making. It's not manufacturing unless you're making it with the intent to sell it. Um, <laughs> it really gets me when it echoes my um. <laughs> oh, maybe in StreamYard over here I can... Uh, I don't think I can, because it's expecting the person. Oh, got it. Connect the Bluetooth. And then it will only talk to the Bluetooth. Oop, that was power off. Power on. It's supposed to say connected. Connected. Now, it should only talk to the Bluetooth. And if you guys want to hear the echo, you can pass it around. Got better, right? There's a solution to every problem. Where were we? Manufacturing make stuff people want. Or no, I used to call it make stuff people want, but really it's make stuff with the intent to sell. You can't sell it though, unless people want it, right? So who are those people? The people that we want to sell stuff to, if we're manufacturers, who are they? Customers. All right, so we have manufacturers. I'm gonna call manufacturers MFG because as I said, I can't spell. We have customers, is that enough? The manufacturers, we have customers. We're gonna talk about both of those groups here. Now, who might be a customer of a manufacturer? So customers could be businesses. They could be big businesses or small businesses. Who else could be a customer of a manufacturer? Yeah. A distributor. And so distributor is a kind of business, right? But the distributor is buying it with the intent of selling it again. And so that could be any reason all the way from a wholesaler down to the last retail step, right? So if you're, if you're uh, doing drop shipping on Amazon, getting all your stuff from deepest, darkest China, for, or just ordering it from Alibaba the day after somebody orders it from you on Amazon, which you could totally do and make a profit, I'm certain. Um, you're a distributor then, right? So there's other kinds of businesses that buy stuff from manufacturers who are basically also manufacturers, right? So Ford, General Motors, Toyota, all those U.S. car makers. Toyota makes a lot of cars in the U.S. now. Those car makers, they don't make all the parts that go in the cars, right? If you didn't know that, I can tell you they don't make all the parts that go in the cars. Some of the parts that go in General Motors pickup trucks, for example, are made in Pittsburgh. I know this for a fact because there was a strike at one of the GM plants several years ago, and um, they had to shut down production because none of the workers were coming to work. It's kind of the thing when strikes happen. 
when the GM assembly plant shuts down production, do they still want to buy stuff from their vendors? <laughs> Ooh, they cancel, shut down all their orders, stop everything. So then when the guys in General Motors in Detroit want to get paid more, the guys in Fitchburg don't get paid at all because they don't have a job and they're not part of that union. So that kind of sucks for that. But anyway, so GM worked out their, their strike issue, their labor issue. They reopen the factory. They need those seatbelt parts. Now it takes the shop, the small shop. I think they had 10, 10 employees, the small shop in Fitchburg that was making those components. It takes them a while to get all the people back to work because they had to lay them off. It takes them a while to spin up that production run again to be making sufficient quantity to put it in a tractor trailer and ship it to Detroit. But the factory in Detroit couldn't run out of parts. So every two hours, there was a Learjet at the Pittsburgh airport loading on just enough parts to get them another three hours of production in Detroit. Not a very effective way for shipping, but customers could be big and small, they'd be for distribution. They could be the consumer, right? All right, so those are our sort of our types of different customers that manufacturing companies deal with. Anybody know what percentage of the U.S. economy is based in manufacturing? Anybody want to guess? I actually don't know the specific number off the top of my head, but I got a general idea. Anybody want to guess? Yeah. Are you talking about local manufacturing? Or? Well, just manufacturing sector. So you go on, uh, you watch the news or whatever, and they say manufacturing jobs are up or manufacturing numbers are up or construction starts are down. Those, those kind of industry-wide, what do they call those, macroeconomics? Yeah. You guys have to take an economics class when you're here at WPI, right? One or two? Or just some social science class? Yeah, I took... I can't remember if it was macro or microeconomics. It was in that same classroom in Caven that I was supposed to be teaching in when I was in Washburn 229. I told you about the beginning of the thing. I do recall falling asleep in the middle of a lecture. Well, actually, no. You never really recall falling asleep in lecture, do you? I do recall waking up in the middle of a lecture. And it wasn't the class I was in. Everybody had left, and the new class came in, and the new professor started teaching before I woke up. <laughs> so I wasn't that into economics back in undergraduate days. Um, so any idea what percentage of the U.S. economy is considered to be a manufacturing sector? Yep. He says 5%. Who says higher than 5%? All right. What do you think, then? He says 20%. Who thinks it's higher or lower than 20%? Or higher? I guess higher or lower, yes. If you think it's 20%, keep your hand down. <laughs> you think it's higher? What do you think? Maybe 60. Maybe 60. I think the official number is somewhere in the range of 20. Um, but let's think that through. What do you, what's the largest segment that we talk about in the U.S. economy? Yeah. I think I think people are telling us that service is the largest part of the U.S. economy. Um, not certain that it actually is. And there's different kinds of services, right? There's financial services and there's work at McDonald's services, which those people don't get paid the same, right? Yeah, so there's different types of service. But I think service is listed as the highest segment of the U.S. economy. Where does the wealth come from? It, or, what is wealth? So he says money over here. Capital. capital is another way to refer to money usually. So yeah, I mean, capital is like a fancier way to say it. We like capital. Capital it implies that you're using the money to do something like manufacturing or to invest. You're using that money to invest. But what is wealth? So who would like to be wealthy? Who would enjoy, who thinks they would enjoy being wealthy? Yeah, okay. So we all think we would enjoy being wealthy, but it means something a little bit different to each of us probably. But I think overall we agree that, that having wealth 
is having an accumulation of something you value, right? So I'm wealthy when I have a big pile of stuff that I value, right? And it, it could be friendship. I could have a lot of friends and I could be wealthy because I value friendship more than anything else. But most of us mean money when we talk about wealthy, right? All right, so how do you, how do you get wealth? Because we all, we all said we'd like to be wealthy. How do you get wealth? You invest in a house. Uh, we could talk offline, but I'm, I'm going to say not unless you're renting it to somebody else. Um, uh, improve your financial knowledge. Improve your financial knowledge. My 7-year-old had this figured My My 13-year-old daughter had this figured out when she was 7. Yep. You could have a high income. All right, so having a high income and then not spending it all. Right, my, my aunt tells me that we're all just broke at a different level. Right, it doesn't matter how, how much your income is, or we're all just broke at a different level. But having a high income and then not spending it all could be a way to accumulate wealth. Being really lucky. Being really lucky. I've heard I've heard several generals say I'd rather be lucky than good. Um, and I, I think I've heard businessmen say that too. So, but what is luck? Luck is being prepared when an opportunity arrives. So like work the stock market. So work the stock market. All right. So let's. So you said high income. What do you do to get your high income? Um, I don't need a specific thing, but typically to get an income, you have a profession that other people value. So we all think doctors have high incomes, right? And and a lot of lawyers tend to have high incomes because they're protecting the doctors who screwed up. <laughs> um, but but we're doing some service that other people value, right? And who's giving us the income? Yeah. It, well, our employer typically, right? Yeah. We we would like to think our employer is getting it from the consumer. Yeah. Although for decades Amazon wasn't getting their revenue from the consumer, they were getting it from investors, right? Um, so it doesn't have to be from the consumer, but we're, our employer is giving us the the money, the salary, whatever we call it. Where did they get it? So they may get it from a consumer, they may get it from an investor, but when we're when we're doing service like this, and so being the the uh, the the person working the fry later at McDonald's, that's a service job, right? Is McDonald's a service company? It's a trick question. They take you to your food to people. Deliver food, yeah. I'm not sure I would call it food, but <laughs> <laughs> but I know what you mean. Um, so actually, the McDonald's Corporation makes most of its money as a real estate corporation. They buy the land and lease it to the people they sold the franchise to. It's kind of a cool model, but. McDonald's is actually a manufacturing company. And think about it, they're not really cooking. They're processing the stuff that they call food. But, uh, but McDonald's is often classified as a manufacturing company. They do assembly processes. They, they add heat to stuff. When we're heat treating steel, we add heat to stuff. So, uh, so you, can, you look at McDonald's as a manufacturing company too. But um, here's the thing. There are two, arguably maybe three ways to acquire wealth. You can dig it up out of the ground, right? So you could trek off into the mountains with a shovel and start digging for gold. So you could acquire wealth by digging it up out of the ground. You could dig up bauxite and turn it into aluminum. There's other things that you could dig up out of the ground. So you could dig wealth up out of the ground. You can trade for it right and this is what we see this is typically in the service economy what we see is people trading time for money or trading goods for other goods or goods for money so our distributors are just trading they're not manufacturing anything right so we dig wealth up out of the ground we can trade for wealth if your economy is based on trading do you think that there are people who are good at that? 
What happens in an economy that's based on trading for wealth? Digging enough out of the ground and trading for it. Wealth is finite. There's only so much in the ground, right? And people are good at trading for it. All of it goes to the top. And you get a big separation between ultra wealthy and poor, right? And so when you talk about your 1% or your 0.1%, those people are often very good at trading. They're very good at collecting money that other people had. What's the third way to acquire wealth? Yep. You have inherited. That's just trading. We're trading by knocking off our old relatives. Or just or simply waiting. We could have patience. Um, it. I think that's another form of trading. Right? <laughs> so uh, in I mean, taking it from people you know or don't know, right? But that's another form of trading. I actually have some experience with that form of trading. <laughs> people took money from me. Not, you know, I suppose I've probably taken money from people and didn't even realize I was doing it. Um, what it, You turn the stuff from the ground into something more useful? You take a raw material, a thing that has a value, right? And people have agreed what the value is and you turn it into something that has more value. You do a value added process on the thing that had some value. So the raw material. And so the raw material for a Big Mac is what? Do all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun, right? So those are the raw materials. It's not a Big Mac until somebody stacks them together, wraps them up and sticks them in the microwave. I, that's not the order. They put the cheese on the patty, put it in the microwave. I think they heat the bun. Is the bun there? I, know, I never worked at McDonald's. I did work the chain grill at Burger King for a while, though. Actually, when I was your age, as freshman year in college, I wanted to have a car on campus. The only way they would let you have a car on campus is if you had a job. So I went to the newspaper. And I settled on Burger King. There was an ad for male dancers, and I decided I didn't want to find out what it was. But, um, what time is it? I can't see the clock in here. 28. 28. All right, sweet. We're not behind time. Sometimes I talk too much. Um, what's your name? Gabriel. Gabriel. Are you typically going to sit in that spot? I guess. Sure. Now he is. <laughs> kind of put him on the spot there. Are you typically going to come to class? Yeah. All right. If I get too far off the topic that you think we're supposed to be on, just like, you know, like <clears throat> something like that. All right. You know, make eye contact too. And then I may or may not ignore you. <laughs> Manufacturing is making stuff to sell. Manufacturing is taking raw materials doing manufacturing processes on them with the intent to sell them, right? Now, you won't be a manufacturing company very long if you're not any good at the selling part. Does that make sense? This class is not going to focus on the selling part, but I never want to forget the selling part because you're not going to be a manufacturing company very long unless you can do the selling part. Selling part. Um, let's see, we're on the title slide. So this is the slide that we have up before the lecture starts. This is why your job is important. Uh-oh. Is that the timer to tell me to move on? Sometimes I do that. I set the timer on my phone to tell me to move on. This thing now seems to have timed out. I wonder if it's still alive. Yeah. Wow. It's asking if it's allowed to use my camera and microphone. I think we lost it. Whoa, it's back on. Well, the other well, live stream seems to be working. And that camera focus camera is somewhere focus. over here. So I'm probably on camera if I'm over here. It's got my good shoulder. Shoulder. Manufacturing making stuff people want to buy. Um, um, all right, so we're going to focus in this class. Anybody know, know 
which manufacturing process we're likely to spend the most time talking about in this class. First, uh, uh, name some manufacturing processes. Right, and so these could be also making processes. You don't have to use them to manufacture. I have a really good friend who recently made a watch, but he didn't intend to sell it. So he wasn't manufacturing, even though he had to use very precise manufacturing quality equipment to make it. So what are some manufacturing processes? Process is something that changes raw materials into something else, right? CNC milling. milling. <laughs> All right. All right. Can I just put CNC turning right next to that? So milling and turning are manufacturing processes. CNC actually stands for computer numeric control. Of course it uses numbers if it uses a computer. But that term comes from 1947 because they used to call it numeric controlled. And then after we got the computer, because they used a computer to figure out what they were going to do, but then they just fed information to the machine tool one, one, one bit at a time as it was doing its machining. Um, and then they got the computer more well lined more up well lined and then up. you can feed the information faster. That's good faster. because the machines move faster now, but computer numeric but control, control, we use the term use even the term. though it could have just been computer controlled. Um, um, what's some other manufacturing process? Other manufacturing These are the two we're going to use. Most we're gonna use. And that is because we have 11 seats machine, machine tools, tools on the first floor next door. So it's easy for us to do those processes here. But give me some other manufacturing some processes. Other manu yes. Yeah. 3D printing. 3D printing. There's about a thousand, about ways, to ways, to thousand ways to do that. We'll just put 3D printing. What else? What else? Injection mold. Injection mold. My first my job first at a manufacturing company, company was an injection molding injection company. Molding company. I, drove pork chop. I drove a pork chop. That was my job. Was my I moved job. boxes of plastic wrap from crowd. one location in the warehouse, in the warehouse other locations in the, locations in the warehouse, or onto, or onto trucks on the way to Walmart. Walmart. We, would we would sometimes put an entire 53-foot tractor trailer, tractor trailer, one product, one product going to one Walmart. one Walmart. That one product, that one product you have one in your dorm room. These little fake These plastic little milk crates. Plastic they milk look crates. like milk crates, but they break milk if you step on them. We made those. We made them. They made them in Worcester. Made them in Worcester. Uh, cast, uh, cast Casting. Casting. What else? Water jet cutting. Water jet cutting. Water jet. Water jet. What else? What else? Laser. Laser. When I tour of a shop a couple years ago, they had a, oh, jeez, it was, I can't remember how many kilowatts the laser was, but it was cutting through two inch thick stainless steel about this fast. It's pretty amazing. We have a 60, uh, we have a 150 watt laser over here. It doesn't cut through stainless steel. I had some serious laser I envy. Right. Laser um, envy. Um, some other product. Bending. 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 We should probably all do more we bending. All do more bending. for our posture for and our posture muscles. And our... Yeah. Yeah. EDM. 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 Electro EDM. discharge EDM. machining. Machining. What else? What else? Thermal forming. Thermal forming. Might be like bending, Might but you can like stuff, stuff up first. Doesn't have to be bent though. Doesn't have to be bent though. Welding. Welding. Did you know that there's a type of 3D printing where you take a welder and you put it on the end of a six-axis robot, and then you simply lay down material and you pick up. 
It's one of the first types of metal 3D printing that ever happened. Printing 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 we actually have capacity to do that here at WPI somewhere. Yeah. They moved it to Sagamore. Um, go ahead. I have a cool story about welded 3D printing. I could do that, but we're not done. There's a lot more manufacturing processes. Yes. ECM. What's what did you say? ECM? Yeah, electrochemical manufacturing. Oh yeah, yeah. Machining. machining. Electrochemical machining. So like that's lith lithography and stuff like that, where you you put down a mask and then you put some chemicals on it and eats away the stuff that's not on the mask. Yeah. Um, let's let's think about some other ones. Painting. Sewing. Sewing is to be a big industry around here. Plating. Is the list virtually unlimited? Anything you could do that would change a raw material into something that has more value is a manufacturing process. Except perhaps moving it from one place to another. Often you can change the value of something simply by moving it from one place to another. I'm not quite willing to make the stretch that that's a manufacturing process, but maybe I would because often to do manufacturing, you must move stuff from one place to another. It becomes a required process in, I don't know, it's a philosophical, that, that question deserves beer, which unfortunately we shouldn't probably do at eight o'clock in the morning. Most of you can't legally do here in Massachusetts, so there will be no beer in class. It's a sad, sad day. Um, so I was going to show this video in the class and watch the cool video later. This cool video, you should really watch this cool video. But I also, I talk too much. We don't get to do the cool videos today. How many people feel like you have mental fatigue? Cool you, you know, you know what this robot is, right? Yeah. You see the. Um, Closet. Oop, but not at that spot. The little ear things that stick up there. We made those in Washburn. We're one of the sponsors for Bike Force. How many people? Um, all right, pay attention. This gets tricky. That's the gym. Quick thing. All right, we talked about what is making. We talked about what is manufacturing, right? I'm just checking my slides to make sure I didn't forget anything important. I usually print this stuff out and have a little handout so I spread out on a table in front of me. And then I look at them as I'm going through it. So I make sure I don't miss anything important, even if I don't use any of the slides. I try to talk about all the stuff that's on the slides in case you miss lecture and all you do is look at the slides. Um, yeah, so, so we started manufacturing way back a while ago, right? We started manufacturing as soon as somebody started specializing in making tools and then trading them to the hunters and gatherers in exchange for meat and berries and nuts. That's when manufacturing really started. Because as soon as we started to specialize, it even before we started farming, we started doing manufacturing. In fact, if we hadn't been doing manufacturing, I don't think we could have started farming. Uh, anybody know what this one is? picture was taken in Windsor, Vermont, but that's not where the thing was invented. This is a, it's actually only a model. It's sort of like Camelot. Is it a water powered sewing machine? It is water powered, I think. Steam engine. Say again? Uh, steam engine. It is the machine tool that enabled Watt to create a factory to make steam engines. It is Wilkinson's boring machine. Wilkinson was Watt's partner. Wilkinson actually owned a machine shop. And he bought one of Watt's early steam engines. And it didn't work that well. And the problem with early steam engines was, it, the, so you get pressure and it moves the piston and then, then the piston moves up and down and then it turns a shaft, right? So you got the crankshaft, all this stuff. The problem with the early steam engines was the, the allowance between the pistons and the cylinder walls. Each one was made by hand. Like, like a guy with a file or a hammer making those things round. 
Wilkinson invented this boring machine so that he could make long straight holes in metal. That enabled Watt to then make cylinders that were all the same size. It was a lot easier to make the pistons than it was to make the cylinders. Wilkinson and Watt went into business together, started creating steam engines, created the Industrial Revolution around the world. Um, that's a model of Wilkinson's thing at the American Precision Engineering Museum in Windsor, Vermont. What's this one? Anybody? Anybody? And I've dated this slide. That's how many years I've been using this slide in this lecture. Anybody? Yeah. Is it Skylab? It is not. It's the Dragon Space Module. The reason the Dragon was there was because when I made this slide, one of my former students was head of propulsion system design on the Dragon Space Module. So I thought that was cool. So manufacturing really started as art, right? We're attempting to make manufacturing more like a science. And it's the oldest profession. And I think it's the reason civilization exists. Okay, cool. Uh, we talked about value, right? We talked about value and wealth and accumulating that. What's the value of a $100 bill? Back before I was married, I used to do this with an actual $100 bill. <laughs> What's the value of a $100 bill? Yeah. It's really worth what somebody's willing to give you in exchange for it, right? Uh, but oh, what what's so it's the value of hundred dollar bill? I suppose is a hundred dollars. What's our currency backed by? Absolutely nothing. Well, I disagree. Well, after nineteen seventy six, it's not. We're off the gold standard now, right? We are off the gold standard since Nixon. Yes. So it used to be uh, you could exchange a dollar for a certain amount of gold. And we were, it, it was by law, you could exchange a dollar for a certain amount of gold at any bank because they had to have the gold on hand. Um, in 76, we went off the gold standard for good. That was the second time we got off the gold standard. Um, what did going off the gold standard allow the government to do? Print as much money as they felt like, right? That's how we get more money in the U.S. Actually, they don't even print it anymore. They simply allow banks to lend on a higher multiple of how much they have on deposit. Right now, banks can lend about 10 times what they have on deposit. And when you apply for a loan from a bank and they give you the loan, they created the money at that moment. That money didn't exist before they gave it to you. It's kind of a cool thing. But what, bank, what backs the value of the U.S. currency? Confidence. And I'm going to say the 82nd Airborne. <laughs> right? People are afraid that if they don't pay us, the debt, nations are afraid if they don't pay us, the debts will go take them, right? Or maybe confiscate their oil fields. What's cost? Anybody know what the cost of printing a hundred dollar bill is? Any guesses? Yeah. Less than $100. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, so it depends on which vintage. The uh, the older bills are about seven cents. The new bills are about twelve cents, thirteen cents to print. So high margin on hundred dollar bills, huh? You should go into the business of making those. Uh, I think if you're not the U.S. Treasury and you're printing hundred dollar bills, it may cost more. You may have there may be other hidden expenses like running from the FBI and Secret Service. <laughs> All right. So what's the difference between value and cost? the last topic of today. Good, we got five minutes left. Yes? Well, you said, would someone put would kind of like numerical values someone would be willing to pay for something? Yeah, so what do we call the difference between value and cost? It's definitely margin. Uh, yeah, margin is a word we use. The word we're going to use in class is profit. E equals value minus cost. Now, in this equation, the value we're talking about is the value your customer puts on whatever you've produced. Right? So it's the amount of currency. Let's just say money because most, most exchanges these days happen with money. 
is the amount of money the customer is willing to give you for the thing that you've produced. And the cost is the amount of money that you spent to make the thing that you produced. Now, the accountants and management people and finance people, there's all different kinds of value and all different kinds of costs and all different kinds of profits. And you got gross profit and net profit and all that. We don't care about that in this class. What we will be caring about, though, and I'll have you think about, oh, this is evil. No, I think it's on the next slide. You can just do the presentation. But what's the first derivative of profit with respect to time? I'm just going to make you like do it for homework and put it on your thing, but I'm just going to tell you. All right. Math classes are cool, right? You get to, you get to like do all this calculus stuff and integrals and derivatives and we can do L'Hopital's rule, right? This is a few words I remember from math class. I should remember that one because I took Calc 3 three times. <laughs> so I remember that one. I took Calc 3 three times because it was too easy. I didn't want to do the homework because it was boring. And I could answer all the questions on the test, just not in the hour they gave me. Because I hadn't done any of the homework. Go figure. And it took me the third time to figure out that was the problem. The different problem. Um, we're engineers though, right? Not mathematicians. Most of us. Sweet. We're just going to say over time. Right? First derivative of profit is value minus cost over time. And I call this profit rate. It's really the rate in which a company makes a profit that is important for whether or not the company succeeds or fails. So we will talk a little bit about profit rate. Um, I think I covered all the learning stuff pretty well. Oh, uh, yeah, we're not doing that now. I changed the order of lectures. That used to be the second lecture. Um, there's a syllabus in Canvas. There's a quiz that I never specified the due date for in the syllabus that's called Week Zero Quiz. That quiz is nominally due tomorrow. However, for the week zero quiz and the week zero quiz only, there really is no due date because I know people join the class after the week zero quiz is due sometimes and all that stuff. So it'll say that it's due tomorrow. No points will be taken off for the week zero quiz being late. The quizzes that fall in the homework folder, which should be almost all of the quizzes, will be unlimited attempts. There is no reason not to get 100% on those quizzes. However, the ones that have mathy questions, it'll be the same question, but different numbers. So you can't just type in the number from the last one. You actually have to do the math again. Um, and there may be some other times where there's versions of the question, but it's all the same question. It's just slightly different. Um, there's the before your first lab quiz. The name of the quiz tells you something about it. You need to have finished it before your first lab. It's due at noon on Monday. It's the only assignment that's going to be due at noon on any day. Normally, I do midnight the day that it's due. Um, there's a late policy in the syllabus. You should read that. In fact, I think in order to pass the week zero quiz, you have to acknowledge that you have read that. Um, see what else, what else, what else? Labs will begin on Monday next week. But if you don't have labs scheduled on Monday, don't show up on Monday. If you don't have labs scheduled on Monday, that means you're in section two, three, or four, and that means you have a lab on Tuesday. Um, I'll, I'll put out, I'm gonna do a video online that describes all this in detail. But um, <clears throat> the um, for the labs, you're expected to be in the lab during your entire scheduled lab time. There will be a 35 minute window of each scheduled lab time where you're expected to be standing in front of one of the machine tools. So, and you'll know when that is when you get there, but you should be at lab on time. And there's a computer lab where you're going to work on the computer part of the lab stuff. There'll be PLAs and stuff there that can answer your questions if you're stuck on the programming stuff. And then everybody will spend 35 minutes twice a week actually running a machine. So by the end of M1800, I hope that you have developed enough muscle memory and enough skill that you are capable of operating the machines to make stuff that you've designed and that you feel welcome 
to operate the machines to make stuff that you've designed. Um, that's my goal for the lab stuff. We meet again on Tuesday in this room at the same time. Oh, and Wednesdays. Wednesdays were always supposed to be scheduled. They screwed it up when they published the schedule. Some of you, I think, have physics at the same time as our Wednesday lecture. You can choose which one to go to. These will all be recorded. You'll be able to watch the videos. If you feel that that's a problem and don't want to double up like that, um, you can change to a different class. That's all I can do about it right now. StreamYard. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Stop sharing. Give me a second. Okay. End broadcast.